folks cover us a few minutes for questions, yeah. some brief remarks at the top. Well, welcome back uh, to everyone, back to the Capitol. It's, uh, it's been uh, a long year, as we all know. I want to thank, first of all, uh, State Patrol and the folks who, uh, over this last year, made sure that this gem of, uh, of a state capital, uh, Minnesota's People's House, was, uh, was protected, was maintained, and to the workforce that works in this building of making sure that all safety precautions were put in place, making sure we got folks uh, vaccinated and be able to be back. So we're grateful for that. Also, just wanted to take a few minutes with the Lieutenant Governor and I, many of you have seen this, um, the uh, budget forecast for May have come in, and Minnesota has another additional $1.8 billion in surplus. Um, it came back from a strong economy. It's gratifying to see. It's gratifying. It's gratifying to see that we were able to not, not have to make false choices between keeping our citizens safe and keeping our economy strong. The numbers are there. They appear to be uh, right on track. I would caution folks to remember that those are budgetary projections. There's probably every reason to believe that they will come in at that number. The economy's fundamentals are strong and continuing to be that way. Gives us the opportunity, um, looking to the future, to make those investments that make a difference in Minnesota, making investments in our children, making investments in our infrastructure, making investments in the things that make Minnesota strong, the research and innovation that have led uh, to so much of this job creation. So we're grateful for that. Lieutenant Governor. I just wanted to welcome people back to the, the Capitol. Welcome to your house. Um, it has been I think over 400 days uh, that we've uh, we haven't had folks here, and so it feels good to be back. And we're glad that people's voices and uh, just uh, opinions and advocacy are where they should be. So welcome back, everybody, into the press as well. A couple yeah. quick questions from credential members of the press. Governor, I spoke to several lawmakers at a panel I moderated today, and all of them seem to agree that there's no chance of a one-day special session in and out. Most of them predicting this will go right down to June 30th. Uh, do you see any way of avoiding that? Well, that's unfortunate. Yeah, it's compromise and get the work done. Um, we've had plenty of time. Everyone's known this. Our budget has been out since the 20th of January. There's adjustments that are made as these numbers come in. This latest uh, budget projections won't impact those numbers that are already there. And there's uh, every reason to believe that in a divided legislature, you simply reach compromises and move on. So uh, I would just tell them we're going to sit down today. Um, we're going to work with folks on the sticking points that they have in each of these bills. We're going to try and find compromises as the democracy demands and get it done. But I, I would caution folks that this is not like a light switch you turn off and on. We've known when this budget was goes. We have biennium budgets in this state that gives us ample opportunity to uh, project forward. These numbers today um, certainly uh, validate the point that Minnesota's fiscal position from the budget that we did in 2019, the AAA bond rating that we have, Minnesota's fiscal position is the strongest of any of the 50 states. Our pension funds are rated first in the country across the whole spectrum. So the idea that Minnesotans and taxpayers should have a high expectation that we finish this, I, I get nervous when I hear them say those types of things because the contracts that we have require us to start thinking about whether it be road construction projects or other things, we have to start winding those down. They cost a lot of money to wind them down. And everybody's saying, well, they're coming back again on the first. Well, the legal requirements force us to make, start taking those things back down and then stepping them back up again afterwards. That's just not a responsible way to govern. Just a quick follow-up. The fact that there are advocates now in the building looking for school choice and other issues, is that going to put a lot more pressure on you and the House and Senate to get things done? Is that going to slow things down or speed things up? Well, I think one thing is, is it's great to see that people have their First Amendment rights to express their opinions. These are things that have been out there. I hope that legislators have been listening to their constituents as we have. They're starting to gather these different ideas, and then they come to some compromises. So I. I I, I hope so. I think it makes a difference. I think you get folks here to express their opinion. They hear answers to some of the questions that they have, and then we reach that compromise. So I think it's a good thing. You're sitting down with who specifically? We will be sitting down with the conference committees today. And when we say we, it will be myself, uh, our commissioners, and um, some of our policy experts. That would be then the Senate and Senator uh, Gazelka and the Senate leads and then Speaker Hortman and those leads. This is the way the democracy is supposed to work where we have divided government, the only one in the country, that they're supposed to be holding these hearings, they're having these ideas, they will bring them forward and we will compromise to get them done. We have a schedule set um, late into today. Um, we'll be starting out talking about health and human services. 
We will do an education budget meeting. We're going to be talking housing, um, and we'll just move down through the list. And what we'll try and do is, is that the conference committees will bring in where their sticking points are, and we'll try and see if there's compromises to, to de-conflict some of those things and bring in a budget. That's starting today at 1 o'clock um, to be able to start getting those done. And then what the way that should work is those conference committees should go back, they should finalize what they're going to do, they should get them to the folks who are going to draft these things, and they should be ready. So to Tom's question is, I'm still operating under the assumption that we're going to get these 13 areas worked. We're going to have to do a, quite a bit of compromise. There's probably not going to be a lot of policy changes because those are the most sticking points. But as far as the budget numbers go, we're very close. Those should be able to lock up. Again, I would remind folks, strongest pension system in the state. We're going to be running about a $3.5 billion surplus. We're going to have tax cuts for 80 plus percent of Minnesotans in this and be able to fund those programs that we need. That coupled with the federal assistance through the American Rescue Plan and what I'm hoping happens with a transportation and infrastructure package, um, we should be really set. So they'll go back and do that. My hope is, is that they can get these 13 things done. I plan on working all weekend with them, is we should be able to come in Monday and wrap this thing up. That would be my hope. Um, we'll see. But that's up to the legislature. Governor, if the state has all this money, what's the problem? Where, what's, the, what's the sticking point to getting this done? It, it's ideological on certain things that we're going to see, and there's things that people need to see. We've seen it this year. Um, through the pandemic, we saw a, a health pandemic turn into, and it, it's pretty clear to everyone, um, became pretty politicized. We have some off-ramps we need to get. You keep hearing me talk about this. We need to get an off-ramp done on the eviction moratorium that kept people in their houses, kept people safe, but we also need to get that done so that landlords get paid. And what we've been saying from the beginning, and this is absolutely the case, that if the eviction moratorium ends tomorrow, there is no legal recourse for any landlord to be paid through the federal assistance fund. So I've been asking since January, why don't you guys just write it into law and whatever you come up with, I'll sign. Whatever comes out of the House and Senate, I will sign, we'll get eviction moratorium, we'll move out. Those things are not done yet. And so those have to be taken care of because we have to figure out uh, that off-ramp. And then, of course, there's concerns as we talk about a whole spectrum of things from police reforms to public safety and how we think about post-pandemic, how we do that. Um, and then there's going to be folks that are going to want systemic change in areas where the difference is too great that there will just be a stalemate and a status quo will, will maintain itself. I don't think, for whatever reason, folks have come to that conclusion that they're not going to get everything they want. They're going to have to compromise to get there. One more today. Sure. Where are some of those biggest sticking points and how do you resolve them between all the people in the room? Yeah. Well, having done this the last cycle, the last biennium budget, and again, I'll make the case that the budget we came up with together in divided government put Minnesota on some of the strongest financial footing that we've seen, and that's being proved out today with those numbers. With that being said, the numbers are, and Theo's point is right on this, the numbers are there's no revenue increases, there's tax cuts involved, and there's investments in things of making sure we're coming back from the post-pandemic as far as summer school, some of those types of things that are out there. So that part of it's not there. It's these big ideological differences that folks are putting into this. And then I've heard this since I've been here, and my time was spent trying to figure this out at the federal level, uh, Lieutenant Governor, of course, worked in here, that we've always heard that in even number years, you don't do policy things or you don't, you don't, uh, you, you, you do those things in those numbered years. That this is a budget year. This is a year to get this budget done, to get this tied up. And then that next year, going into uh, to the even numbered years, you can talk policy. You can get those types of things. That's why we, some of the things that I proposed last year did not happen. Um, in 2019 because they said, well, you're working on a budget. We can't do it. We tried to do it in 2020, but because of the pandemic, that caused some problems. So I think what I would say is, is the passion that people feel for all these issues, that's real. That's what you should be doing. But the way that the state government works here is trying to tie those to a fiscal budget is where you really get bogged down. Now, I know there's a school of thought that says, yeah, but that's leverage. That's leverage. The public right now, we're recovering from COVID. The numbers are good. Things are open back up again. All of those things are starting to happen. It's just irresponsible not to finish a budget directly on time. And, and we, have that, we have that capacity to do it. So I think the tie up here is, is people are trying to do policy changes and, and I'm not gonna pass judgment on whether they're valid or not. That's, that's what the democracy is supposed to decide. But the functional side of government says, 
the budget is due July 1st or things shut down. And, and I think there's great debate about what the 2017 Supreme Court decision on government shutdowns and funding means. Um, it ranges from folks who say, what do we do with the prisons? Do we open up the doors and let everyone out because we don't have the capacity to fund or to keep them open? And everybody says, well, that's insane. You won't do that. Um, the courts have not clarified exactly what that does mean. So I've always approached this like this. We have a constitutional responsibility to do a budget. Should have been done on May 15th. There's no excuse not to do it. We are now down to the end of the wire. You want a whole bunch of things done on this. It isn't going to happen. What we should do is finish the budget numbers, the straight budget numbers, reach a compromise on that. Because from a taxpayer perspective, no increase in taxations, revenues are solid, and investments in the things that, that we all can agree upon are there. So we'll see. This is going to be um, the special session will probably be called and the legislature will, uh, will reconvene on Monday. But I think for now, and Lieutenant Governor and I were talking about, this house is open. We've got folks here passionately advocating for their issues is exactly what they should do. This is the normal that we kind of wanted to get back to. And now democracy can be done the way it's supposed to, passionately, respectfully, and at the end of the day, reaching compromise. And Governor, are you gonna, I'm sorry, are you gonna do an emer another emergency order? Monday we will, that they, we will extend as we come to the end of this. It's another, uh, we are now at a, uh, at a 15 month low in terms of infections. We had eight more deaths today, um, but our numbers look solid. Our vaccination efforts are still taking place. Um, I think between now and hopefully Monday, we can figure out this off ramp on the eviction moratorium. And then I think there's a date certain where there's just a very few things, vaccinations and some federal help that we're getting um, along with the 45 other states who are in the same space as we are. But we will do that on the 14th. And that should lead us into, I would guess, the if not the final one of the final times we need to do that. So I think from the legislature's perspective of not having to come back in 30 days, to wrap this thing up next Monday or Tuesday and move on. All right, Governor, if we're all said and done, are you hoping for a bonding bill? Well, yes, in terms of, and those folks who are here listening and Minnesotans who are out there, bonding, just like for many of us, um, when we bought our house, we couldn't pay cash for it. So we took out a mortgage on that. We paid, our goal was, is to get a mortgage that had a very good interest rate and then equity built up into our house so that that's where our wealth came from. Um, the same thing is true of a state. We have our roads, our bridges, our buildings, all of those things, and you need to keep them up. Just like when your roof needs to be re-roofed, you re-roof it. And while you don't want to have too much debt that you can't handle, states like Minnesota have the capacity to bond, um, and that allows you to even increase your uh, your credit ratings, if you will. We're AAA rated and we'll continue to stay that way. I think it makes sense with historically low interest rates where we're at financially that you can bond and pay for some of these things in a responsible manner. We should do that. And so um, the thing that I think, again, folks here knows this takes a, uh, a super majority to get a bonding bill done which means you do have to do what used to be an easy thing but is much more difficult now. You have to have Democrats and Republicans together decide to vote on this thing to move it. You don't just move it with the heavy cudgel that you have the advantage and you can do it. So I hope we can. Our capacity to be able to bond um, is solid. And, and the folks who are in finance and in business know this. If you don't keep up your assets, or if you don't show that you can bond for the maintenance of your infrastructure, that actually lowers your ability to borrow, raises your interest rates on other things, and diminishes the capacity of your state to be able to invest. So um, while, while seeming a bit counterintuitive, not being able to do a bonding bill or to be able to keep those things up actually makes when we do borrow more expensive and we get less for it. So I think now is the time. We've got folks ready to work. We've got bonding projects that are already in the hopper. Uh, a good, decent bonding bill that, again, this is bipartisan. Democrats and Republicans agree. The question is, is what do they agree should be in there? So it's hopeful. So right, thanks, folks. Thank thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.